Amazing story, amazing stories. Hasn't this been a great REACH conference? <clears throat> I mean, the things that we have learned, the things that we have been challenged with. So here's what I'd like you to do, because you're all part of the family of Vital Smarts. So what I'd like you to do is turn to your table mates and in 30 seconds, tell them what we're about. What is Vital Smarts about? What is the elevator speech? 30 seconds, go for it. All right, let me pull you back. <clears throat> now, if David's mom had been sitting at your table, she would have said, we're not very smart, right? Uh, if you said something like this, helping people change for good. How many of you were in the ballpark? OK, all right, awesome. Now, in our quest to help people change for good, we might want to consider the following. I came across a statement that was made by former governor and senator Bob Kerry. And this was his question. What is the most powerful, least costly, and most underrated agent of human change? 30 seconds, turn to your table mates and give them an answer. What do you think it is? What do you think it is? All right, here is the answer. This may surprise you because it surprised me. It surprised me and it saddened me as I reflected upon my own life. And this is what he said. Kindness. Anybody get it? A few of you. Awesome. Kindness matters in our interaction with other people, and it may be one of the most underrated agents of change. Now, I'd like to, in the time that we have, focus on two examples, two historical examples that may be beneficial for you and for me. In fact, I'm going to give you the very first date of this historical event and I want you to turn to the people at your table and share with them in 30 seconds what December 7, 1941 meant in history. Quickly turn, December 7, 1941. All right, how many of you said the following? The bombing of Pearl Harbor. How many had that? Okay, yeah. Now, this is amazing because within days, the United States was able to rapidly move forward to enlist and mobilize literally thousands of recruits. And part of what they did is they would put them on troop trains that would move from the East Coast to the West Coast. And of course, those trains had to stop periodically to refuel. And one of the main refueling places was in a place called North Platte, Nebraska. Has anybody ever heard of North Platte, Nebraska? You're kidding. 
Wow, I'm amazed. Yes. Now, here's where we're going to tie this in to kindness. Because 10 days after December 7, 1941, in this town of North Platte, Nebraska, the citizens began to realize that one of the first troop trains carrying their boys, the Nebraska boys from the National Guard, would be arriving. And so they quickly decided to go out in the community and rally support by bringing in cakes and cookies and donuts and coffee and cigarettes, and they had all come to this depot. But the train never came in for 20 minutes, for 30 minutes, and they began to become restless and wondered what had happened. And finally, when the train came into the station, they began to realize as they went out to these cars and began looking for their boys that these were not their boys from Nebraska. These were the boys from Kansas. And they began to take all of their goods, their cakes, their cookies, and all of these homemade goods, and they began to go back into the depot when someone finally yelled, wait a second, what are we waiting for? And they turned around and they went back to these trains and began to share these home goods with their new adopted sons and daughters from Kansas. You see, it was a case of mistaken identity that actually turned into a wonderful point of reference for these individuals who were going off to war. In fact, there was a woman by the name of Ray Wilson who was so touched by what had taken place that she began to immediately go out and gain support with businessmen, with railroaders, with housewives, and they were able to begin starting a movement that would actually take care of all of these troop trains no matter what time of the day they came in, extending a little kindness. From 1941, until ni uh, from 1941 to 1945, there were six million soldiers that came through North Platte, Nebraska and they stopped for 10 minutes. What do you think 10 minutes of kindness would mean to an 18-year-old who was leaving home for the first time and was heading off to war? Well, let me share with you and introduce you to a couple. This is Ralph and Betty Bessie Lethaltz from North Platte, Nebraska. Ralph was an engineer on the Union Pacific Railroad, and his wife was a nurse's aide, and in her spare time, she volunteered at this canteen. Now, the interesting thing is, one of the lessons that we can learn from this canteen is use, utilizing the power of kindness, even for 10 minutes. Can I fit that in my day? Could you fit that in your day? Ten minutes of kindness to reach out to someone to make a difference. We call this paying it forward, okay? It started as a case of mistaken identity that turned into a random act of kindness, we would say today. And here's the interesting thing. That random uh, act of kindness actually served this young man. Because this young man, his name is Bill Nelson, my father was adopted by Ralph and Bessie Lethaltz. And when he went off to war, he told me that for the two years that he spent in the South Pacific on an aircraft carrier, that he would run into new soldiers and new sailors from time to time. And of course, they would always ask his name. And he would say, Bill Nelson. And they would say, well, where are you from, Bill? And he would say, North Platte, Nebraska, and he said many times they would light up like a Christmas tree and say, you got to be kidding me, North Platte? And then they would proceed to say to him, you don't know what a God sent that was. 
on the day that we stopped for 10 minutes, and there were women who looked like my mother, and there were girls who looked like my sister that came out to this train, and they didn't just pass out cookies and cakes, they passed out courage. And they made us feel like we were important and that we had a part to play in this war that we were going to. You never know what 10 minutes will do. Let me go to a second date, October 2, 2006. This was a horrendous day because at the Nichols Mine School in Lancaster County, there was a gunman by the name of Charles Roberts that took hostages, girls, into the school. He killed five girls and then immediately committed suicide. Now, the interesting thing is that on this day, the Amish community not only attended to their own needs, but they decided to go to the shooter's widow, children, and parents and offer them forgiveness on that first day. And also set up a charitable fund for them so that they would be taken care of. Now, I've got to tell you that in the face of this tragedy, it is absolutely uh, phenomenal that the national conversation didn't stay just on the shooting as terrible as it was. It became a national conversation across this country as to how could forgiveness take place. It's not often that we are all engaged in that kind of a conversation. But one of the lessons that the Amish taught us was this. Kindness is not weakness. Kindness is strength under control that has a laser focus on the needs of other people, and they demonstrated that to us. So here's my question. As we become more intentional during these challenges in our life, and when we're tempted to actually engage in revenge, how could we actually engage in something called reverse revenge? And instead of offering that payback that we usually think of evening the score, how could we actually create a situation where we're no longer keeping score because of the care that we have given to each other. I'm going to suggest three things. Stop, look, and listen. Let me take you to this path to action, which you know a little bit about. And yesterday, thanks to Cricket, wherever you are, she shared with us some of Viktor Frankl's approach between creating a gap between stimulus and response. And I would like to suggest to you that between that gap, you and I, under these kinds of conditions, have an opportunity to do something called become receivable. And this is from, actually, Barry Corey's book on kindness. He says, one of the opportunities that we have when we are in these challenging situations with other people is to stop, create a gap, and then begin to think about how could I become receivable? Because here's my premise. This is a wonderful gap that can either be used in a negative way as a reactive gap, or it can be used as a reflective gap. And if I will use this as a reflective gap and begin to think about what it is, as you think about the Amish, how they begin to focus their kindness on the needs of other people, and how this could become something that makes us more receivable. Now, I want you to go back to what Joseph said yesterday, the beginning of the day. If you remember, he said, love plus what? Truth equals growth. Love plus truth equals growth. Now, I'm going to take a little bit of a license here with Joseph's willingness, and I'm going to share with you some information just briefly from a book called Changes That Heal by Dr. Henry Cloud, who's a psychologist. 
And in his book, he says this. He says it just a little bit differently. He says there are three things that have to take place for growth to actually happen, for healing to actually happen. And I'm gonna put this within the framework for you and me to become receivable to other people. The first is grace. There's gotta be grace. And that grace has to be something that is shared with the other person and helps them to understand that they are unconditionally accepted, just as they are. And that grace is the relational component that is so necessary. The second is truth. And that truth is actually a boundary component. Truth is actually something that helps us to create a structure. Now here's the interesting thing. His premise is, is that in every conversation with other people, particularly when there are challenges between stimulus and response, your conversation must include both grace and truth. Because the minute you do not include truth and you only include grace, grace without truth is license. Now, I want you to think about raising your kids. If you never apply truth and you only apply grace and there's no structure, they begin to feel that you really don't care about them. But let me flip-flop this now, because on the other side, if there is only truth and no grace, that becomes judgment. There is a need to balance both of these, and I will share with you that from time to time, you and I need to be able to find a way to include grace, truth, and I'm going to throw one more element, time. They have to know that you are willing to spend the time that is necessary for them to grow in this process. Now, as you think about this, this is another way, another powerful way of creating this change agent. Paying it backwards, but it is reverse revenge. It's a most unimaginable act. And here's the interesting thing. When it is unexpected, when that kindness comes and it's unexpected, and it's the least costly, most underrated agent of change, not only sometimes is it unexpected, but here's the thing, it is undeserved. And yet, if I can begin to create unexpected, undeserved kindness, I will tell you it is one of the most powerful agents that you and I can use to change the world for good. Now, let me give you a quick story because you and I don't live our lives in these extremes, uh, in Pearl Harbor necessarily or in this terrible tragedy. I had something happen to me at the grocery store that I have never had happen to me before. This was a couple of months ago. My wife came to me at the end of the day, and she said, listen, can you run down to the store and get a couple of items? Uh, the kids are coming over, and uh, I just need these three items, and it would be so great if you could get back before they got home. And I said, sure. So I ran down to the store, got the items. I was stepping out of the aisle, and I was surveying where all of the checkout stands, and I saw that the far checkout stand, which was the 10 items only line, there was no one in it. And I was headed for the 10 items only line when a woman came out from another aisle, and she had a basket full of quite a few things and cut in front of me. And as she stepped in front of me, and I was waiting in line, you know what I was doing with my time? I was counting items. <laughs> but I have never had this happen before. As I'm waiting there and the cashier reaches down and grabs her first item and scans it, I hear this out loud. One. And I'm looking around, I don't know where it's coming from. She reaches down, grabs the second item. Two. It's the guy standing behind me <laughs> who has decided to shame this woman into a different behavior, and unfortunately what he missed was the surprise of kindness. Because when we're surprised with kindness, it often brings out the best in us. What a great opportunity. Now, what I would like you to do as we finish this up is I'd like to issue you a challenge. 
When was the last time you paid it forward? When it was unexpected? A random act of kindness. When was the last time that you paid it backward? When it was unexpected and undeserved, an intentional act of kindness, reverse revenge. So here's the interesting thing. If we can become agents of change that use kindness to catch someone by surprise, creating grace and truth and time in that sentence, we have an opportunity to change the world for good. And what we're going to be doing as you exit this ballroom today is you're all going to be given a kind bar. Now, here's what I want you to do with that. I don't want you to eat it. I want you to keep it as a cue and a memento of what you and I are going to do together for the next 30 days. We're going to become more mindful about paying it forward and even the more difficult thing, paying it backward. Because I don't know about you, but the world that I travel in and teach in is hungry for a bite of kindness. Thank you so much.